So let freedom ring from the prodigious seal tops of New Hampshire. These are the Emmett Till players of Chicago. The words they speak are those of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So you got to get those facial mu muscles working. Mamie Mobley leads okay. them. She is the mother of Emmett Till. Emmett Till was a Chicagoan. He was black. And in 1955, when he was 14, he was murdered in Mississippi because he whistled at a woman who was white. Emmett Till, I never heard of him. In Chicago today, many do not know the name of Emmett Till. What can you tell me about Emmett Till? They do not know the significance of his death. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up. We all know the names of the great leaders of the civil rights movement, and we certainly know the significance of their deaths. Of this Chicago teenager we should know and should remember more. Curiously, the only monument to Emmett Till is in Denver, Colorado, where Emmett stands in the shadow of Dr. King. Dr. King never met Emmett, but the movement Dr. King led was profoundly influenced by Emmett's violent death in the Mississippi Delta almost 30 years ago. The story of Emmett Till unfolds in part in LaFleur County, Mississippi, where the Confederate soldier by the courthouse keeps an eternal vigil. It unfolds in part in Tallahatchie County, Mississippi, where another Confederate soldier by the courthouse forever looks east. But the story of Emmett Till begins eight miles north of Greenwood in Money, Mississippi, which is about as small as a town can get. The time, late August, 1955. We finally decided that we would let Emmett go. Emmett's and mother had sent her son to Money, Mississippi for the Labor Day holiday to visit Moses Wright, his great uncle. On the county road, the Bryant family owned a small county store. This is where Emmett Till whistled at the white woman. This store is long since abandoned, but the details of what happened here August 24th, 1955, remain vivid in the minds of those who were here with Emmett Till. He was, a, like to say, a harmless guy. Fun of it. Like to laugh. Simeon Wright was there. He was 12 at the time. The youngest son of the great uncle Emmett Till was visiting. All I know that there was a lot of commotion and people were upset. Wheeler Parker was there. He was 16 from Argo, Illinois, and had joined Emmett on his trip south. And 21-year-old Carolyn Bryant was there. She was thin, black hair, I remember that. Uh, small face. She was a small built woman. She was one of the prettiest 21 or 2-year-old women I ever saw in my life. Roy Bryant, her husband, owned the store. Carolyn Bryant was the woman at whom Emmett Till whistled. Bryant's wife was behind the counter. Uh, he didn't say anything in the store. I think uh, when she came out of the store, that's when he whistled. It was all outside then. That was the incident that touched the whole thing off? That, that's what touched the whole thing off, the whistle. Roy Bryant, the husband, learned of the incident. So did J.W. Milam, his half-brother. Both drove to this spot 2.8 miles east of Money. The home of Great Uncle Moses Wright stood here, and this is where Emmett Till was staying. Moses Wright was a 64-year-old sharecropper. His crop was cotton. He also preached in the Church of God in Christ, and he was not afraid to speak out. Sunday morning, about 2.30, uh, I heard a voice at the door, and I asked, who was it? And they said, this is Mr. Bryant. I want to talk with you and the boy. And I saw this, we call this big bald-headed man coming in with a pistol and a flashlight and they recognized that I wasn't the one, or uh, my uncle that was with me in bed, so they went on through the house. And so we marched on around through two rooms, and I found the boy in the third room, in the bed with my baby boy. I was in the bed with Emmett, and uh, the noise, they, you know, woke me up, and this guy with the pistol told me to lay back down and go to sleep. And it took me a while to figure out what was going on. I just they said, we're going to take the boss. And when they marched him to the door, they opened the door and got to the car. Near to the car, they asked the question, is this the right one? And I heard the boy say, yeah. And they drove off toward money with him. When Emmett Till was next seen, his body was floating in the Tallahatchie River.
Emmett Till was dragged from his bed in his great uncle's home near Money, Mississippi, August 28, 1955. Where is it? The, the sheriff came and told me they had found a body at Tillow. His family was notified three days later that Emmett's body had been found in the Tallahatchie River, 25 miles north of Greenwood, Mississippi. A 200-pound fan from a cotton gin was tied to the body with a strand of barbed wire. Well, the body was very decomposed, very much. In Mississippi, those who pulled Emmett's body from the riverbank have not forgotten what they saw. He didn't look very good. In Chicago, those who prepared the remains for burial have not forgotten either. The box containing Emmett's body arrived at the old Illinois Central Station at Roosevelt in Michigan. I remember when they began to unload the body, I looked and I saw the biggest box I'd ever seen in my life. And I realized that that box had my baby's body in it. And I, I was just overwhelmed with grief. Tens of thousands passed by Emmett's open casket as it lay before the altar of the Roberts Temple Church of God in Christ. As people would file by the casket, almost one in every five would faint. And this included men, women, and children. And the screams, I mean, the, the screams were just incredible. It was almost as if people were looking at their own child there rather than a stranger they didn't know. It was at that time that I knew Emmett was not just mine, he was a universal child. Emmett's funeral was held here September 3rd, 1955. My subject was that day, God has brought him unto himself as a sacrificial lamb to wake the conscience of America of his racism. And from this, many would be delivered. And the move of righteousness would prevail. I also remember very well, I read this verse, Dearly beloved, avenge not thyself, but rather give place for peace. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord, Romans 12 and 19. Emmett Till was an only child. His casket was carried to a small cemetery southwest of Chicago. Here, Emmett Till will rest until God decides otherwise. When they was lowering the remains of the body at Borough Cemetery in the grave, and when that mother fell in my arms and screamed and said, oh God, why? It seemed that a nerve ran all over me. And until this day, I felt the effects of it, to look in the face of an innocent boy. And that was the beginning, I feel, of America really becoming aware of the viciousness of racism. In Jet Magazine, black America at least saw an image it could not forget. The remains of Emmett Till, bloated by the waters of the Tallahatchie, mutilated by the beatings. A picture the Jet uh, photographer uh, took, Jet ran it, and they had to reprint. All over the country there was so much interest in that case. It was a first, you know. The news media did not publish pictures of that nature because it was just something too horrible for the public to see. But if the world had not seen what had happened, I mean, the world needed this shock. They, they needed it. And when these pictures of Emmett hit the newsstands and people were really able to see what had happened to a youngster simply because of hate, and uh, race discrimination. I think it really let us see the ugly monster that uh, race hatred is. It's almost as if it was embodied in, in uh, his appearance, in his physical appearance, because it is a monster. In some sense, it was myself in the coffin. It was 
my brothers in the coffin. It was, I can't describe it precisely. Because it was so, it had been so mutilated, it had been so violated. It was, um, it was him, but it was all of us. Emmett Till's body was found in the Tallahatchie River August 31st, 1955. A week before, this 14-year-old Chicagoan, vacationing in the Mississippi Delta, had whistled at a white woman, 21-year-old Carolyn Bryant. On September 6th, 1955, two white men were charged with Emmett's murder. Roy Bryant, husband of Carolyn Bryant, and J.W. Milam, his half-brother. At the Tallahatchie County Courthouse in Sumner, Mississippi, the murder trial began two weeks later. Physically, virtually nothing has changed in this town since late September 1955. Coming down the street, you can still see the 12 jurors, every one of them white. Coming from the law firm of Breland and Whitten, you can still see the two white defendants, their wives, their children, walking toward the courthouse. Inside, you can still see the mother of J.W. Milam wiping the sweat from the brow of her son. And you can still hear Tallahatchie County Sheriff H.C. Strider. We never have any trouble until some of our southern niggers go up north and the NAACP talks to them and they come back home. Outside the courthouse, the cameras waited. Inside, black reporters sat at a segregated table. Simeon Booker was there. It was a terrifying experience. I've never been in a situation like that where you knew it was a, a trial that had no end because you knew they were going to be freed. Sheriff Strider handed a subpoena to Emmett's mother, commanding her to testify. What was my concern in the courtroom? More or less a matter of getting in and out alive every day. It was quite heated in that courtroom. You could see the hostility, you could feel it, you could know it, but you had to be there. Also there, standing on the courthouse steps, was Congressman Charles Diggs of Michigan, only the third member of his race to be elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. I wanted to know firsthand uh, just how uh, the trial was going to be operated and, uh, and all, all of the uh, dimensions uh, pertaining to it. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and their concept, uh, concept of justice, which I had heard about, but I'd never been directly exposed to. Oh, what a wonderful feeling it was when I knew that a congressman had come all the way from Detroit, Michigan, to join me in that dark hour. We don't need the help of the NAACP. Tallahatchie and County officials feared outside problems. agitators, but the drive for justice was coming from native Mississippians like NAACP Field Secretary Medgar Evers. I do recall Medgar being very, very upset, to the point of tears. Emmett's own great uncle Moses Wright turned out to be the key prosecution witness. He had a big church of people. His Mississippi neighbors still recall the man who preached in a small church just off the county road. When I was a little boy, he'd lay his hands on me and sitting on his knee. He was truly a father, a great man, full of the Spirit of God. Moses Wright was full of courage, too. A Newsweek photo showed Moses Wright, a black man, standing in court, pointing the finger of guilt at two white men. It was a, a real climax. I suppose the first time a black has ever pointed to a white person in Mississippi accusing him of a crime where he could be executed. It was an act of courage, raw courage, because that man didn't know whether his life would be safe uh, or not. Uh, what about putting Bryant and Milam on the stand? How do you feel about that at this time? Of course, we're keeping our plans flexible. We, uh, at this time, don't anticipate it would be necessary to put them on the stand. Defense attorney John Whitten had no need to put his clients on the stand. In his final arguments to the 12 white men who almost 30 years ago sat in these seats, he said, every last Anglo-Saxon one of you men in this jury has the courage to set these men free. You do what you have to do and stay within the limits that ethics require you to stay within. It did not take the jury long to make up its mind. 
After hardly more than an hour's deliberation, it filed back into this courtroom. The foreman rose and read the verdict. Not guilty. Did you expect this verdict? Well, I was hoping, boy. Roy, how about you? I was hoping for the same. Jury members said they would have reached a verdict even sooner if they hadn't stopped to drink pop. Ray Tribble sat among them. I think the jury was right, but what the determination it made. They committed the murder and told me they did and told me how they did. But writer William yeah, Bradford yeah. Huey then heard what the jurors Nobody had not. J.W. Milam and Roy Bryant told him that they had indeed murdered Emmett Till. Huey's article in Look Magazine early in 1956 told the story. But Milam and Bryant, once acquitted by the jury, could not be tried again. And for the murder of Emmett Till, no one was ever punished. I, I, Dave Jordan, do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. July 1st was a historic day in Greenwood, Mississippi. Black officials were sworn into city government for the first time. Just 25 miles from the bend of the Tallahatchie River where the body of Emmett Till was found almost 30 years ago. It will be a new form of city government where blacks and whites will work together. This is another aspect of the legacy of the death of Emmett Till. For the sorrow and the anger three decades ago gave life to a movement. There was a job that needed to be done. It wasn't right for part of the people in the United States of America to have nothing, not even freedom of speech. Well, the whole trial was just a farce. Two days after the men who murdered her son were set free, Emmett's mother spoke at a massive rally in Harlem. 10,000 blacks gathered in protest. Her picture appeared in Life magazine. I know that his life can't be returned, but I hope that his death will certainly start a movement in these United States. She did start a movement. It played a very, very important role in letting all of America and perhaps the world uh, know what was going on behind the cotton curtain. And it was key because it rallied Mississippi blacks who had nothing to say, look, we're going to stand together. In spite of the fear, there was still something inside of us saying, we have no choice, we must change this condition. Affecting change in Greenwood and the Mississippi Delta has not been easy. Are you going to walk in the streets up? Affecting change in Greenwood has taken decades. Get that boot! Get that boot! In the shadow of the courthouse 21 years ago, that was the cry. <laughs> to that cry, there was substantial resistance. But the cry persisted. How are you doing? Hey. Appreciate you. And the efforts of those who have long struggled have now borne fruit. I'm going to tell you a little joke. Seems though that one of the good niggers from Mississippi went up to Washington. In Greenwood City Park 22 years ago, white segregationists rallied where no black man dared tread. In that same park this spring, a black man asked whites for their vote. It's been a long road to the steps of Greenwood City Hall. But whites and blacks now share the political power here. It came through persevering and a continuous struggle day by day, hour by hour. Thank you, and may God bless. But two men have not shared in these changes. They are the two men who murdered Emmett Till. J.W. Milam died in 1981. Roy Bryant, his accomplice, still lives. I just wonder how Mr. Bryant's life has been. I almost feel sorry for him because I don't feel that he's been able to pick up the threads of his life and weave them into something that he would be proud of or that he could be happy about. Roy Bryant today owns a small store in Ruleville, Mississippi. For visitors who ask questions about the past, there is little hospitality here. For Roy Bryant has been abandoned by the woman in defense of whose honor he once killed. Carolyn Bryant sat by him during his trial, left him later. Roy Bryant today says he doesn't know where she is. One day! Men were no longer have to face the atrocities that Emma Till had to face right. or Mega Evers had to face, but that all men can live with dignity. I will dream this afternoon.